Hey, Charlie Pyatt here. In the last episode, I went into the technical side of manufacturing from injection molding to 3D printing and 3D scanning. I also explored a little of how that technology is changing the industrial design field as a whole. At the end of that episode, I closed things out by creating a 3D scan of my head that I'm going to use to make a custom VR headset gasket. In this round, I'm going to be talking about how to set up a software solution that will take in a 3D face scan and output a complete mask for 3D printing. The concept I'm going to be getting into in this episode is the idea of making an automated mass-produced product, which I think is going to be a really big deal in the future of industrial design. It's a pretty cutting-edge topic too, and something I'm really passionate about. So first off, I wanted to show the finished software UI I have for generating custom VR mass geometry. After that, I can get into how this is all working and what exactly is going on in the background here. You can see I have a basic interface. This will look for any 3D scan of a face in the source directory and generate a finished mask in the output folder. The scan data was just taken off my iPhone's structured light face ID system and saved out as a 3D mesh in the STL file format. I covered this more in the last video, but there is no exotic hardware used for doing the scanning. This is set up to batch process scans, so if I have 20 head scans in my input folder, it should output 20 matching custom masks. On the UI, I'm just going to set my input and output folders and then hit the process button. After a bit of a wait, I now have finished masks in my output folder. You can see the generated mask geometry is built using a lattice structure. The structure is adaptive, so each mask that comes out of the system will change depending on the input scan and be totally unique to that one person. The mask has several other design features that I will get into in the next segment. If I turn the mesh view on, you can see that the mask is a single closed manifold mesh. The system was creating meshes that were self-intersecting or non-manifold, then it would cause printing errors. It's important that the geometry coming out of the mask generation system is reliable and repeatable for 3D printing. Otherwise, this mask is perfectly fit to my face and is ready for 3D printing. The really amazing thing about this system is the technology it was built with. This is all created and running in Rhino 3D and Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino that uses visual programming to create geometry. Grasshopper is commonly used in the architectural field to create complex facades and interiors, but it has the potential to be used for much more. If you remember back to episode 2 of this series, I talked about parametric CAD systems and how you can think of parametric design as writing a little program to create geometry. Rhino and Grasshopper elevate that concept by using visual programming or node-based programming to create geometry. You can see here, I made the system that makes the same flat bracket from episode 2. Conceptually, this example and the Fusion 360 model I made are both the same and will result in the same identical geometry. They are both linear instructions that will run and are defined by a series of parameters that will create a finished 3D model. The visual programming environment of Grasshopper just allows for a higher level of complexity in that logic. Node-based design has been around in 3D software for a long time now. Many 3D rendering packages have used some kind of node-based system for creating materials or shaders. More recently, Blender has rolled out its geometry node workflow for creating complex 3D model systems, which is similar to what Rhino and Grasshopper are doing. The line between 3D modeling, parametric CAD, and visual programming is getting more and more blurred, which is really exciting. These systems really lower the barrier for programming complex operations without the need for learning to code. The system used to create the custom mask is all contained within this Grasshopper file. Even the interface I showed earlier is created and runs within this file. This all looks overwhelming at first, but you can break it down into logical chunks and it becomes much more understandable. The system starts with two objects, the imported 3D scan of a face and a copy of the VR enclosure model. The enclosure for the VR headset is always the same and is fixed in space. So the first real step that is happening here is the scan is being imported and positioned in 3D space relative to the enclosure geometry. Then the mask is being generated or drawn in in between those two objects. The face scan is analyzed and then positioned at the right distance and angle to the enclosure. Because I always know where the VR headset will be, I can position the scan so the user's eyes are the best focal distance for the displays. I do a series of cleanup and smoothing operations on the scan geometry in this next step. This generation system uses voxel technology for a lot of the building and processing. My good friend Ryan Onin actually ported over OpenVDB to Grasshopper in a plugin called Dendro that makes these smoothing and boolean operations much more reliable for creating custom products like this. 
With the scan and enclosure oriented correctly, I start getting into the actual mask generation. The first step is to project a mask outline onto the scan face. This will act as the boundary of the mask on the face and in the final build. Additional guide curves connect the enclosure to the mask outline. Now I can do a loft between those objects and make a base form of the mask. These basic steps are really the bulk of the logic for creating the mask. All the rest of the steps are just manipulating and interacting with the basic volume I've created here. The trick with this is really hidden in creating that first face outline. I built a bunch of internal logic into this process that will analyze a face scan and then create a boundary curve at the correct position around the eyes, over the nose, and across the forehead. This curve generation will, hopefully at least, adapt to any face scan run through the system. The next step is to process that mask volume and create my lattice structure for the final design. This lattice structure would not be possible to create using normal injection molding solutions because of all the undercut conditions that I talked about in the last episode. But because this will have to be 3D printed anyway, I don't have those restrictions. This lattice build will have a bunch of functional benefits to the design as well. It will increase breathability and make the part lighter weight. I can also vary the lattice pattern and diameters to adjust the rigidity of the mask in key places for better stability and comfort. I also added a lip on the face side of the mask this will spread the load out of the headset better and, again, increase the comfort and stability. All these little bumps will also help with breathability of the mask on the skin. You can see that there are some additional features that would need to be included for production as well. Each mask is serialized with the input file name embedded into the geometry. Because each of these masks will be unique, there needs to be some kind of serial identifier on each part. Unlike injection molded parts, you can't just grab a random one out of the bin and send it to a customer. Tracking all the correct masks to the correct end user becomes pretty important. You may have also noticed that there's a logo shown on the side of some of the masks. Going back to the original UI, you can see that if I have multiple face scans, some will have a custom logo associated with them. If the system finds a logo saved as a vector PDF with the same file name as the scan, then it will add the logo to the mask geometry. This PDF logo data is automatically oriented and scaled on the model, and then a Boolean operation is performed to create the finished geometry. The final thing I wanted to talk about was air tracking in the mass generation system. If I open the Grasshopper file again, you can see there are a bunch of air code outputs on each of these logic steps here. Built into each one of these are some basic checks to make sure the automation build is going along correctly. If any of these checks are triggered, then the process will stop, output an error code, and move on to the next scan build in the batch. Because each person's face is different, the reliability of automation systems like this need to be monitored and refined as more scans come through. Things might be working great, then someone with long eyelashes or a crazy mustache gets scanned and the pipeline will fail and the logic will need to be updated. These error checks are pretty simple and usually involve a range of techniques. I do basic things like check that the scan's nose is lower than the eye line when it comes out of the orientation phase, and make sure the head geometry and mask model are within certain size ranges. So yeah, this was a quick overview, but it generally covers the logic of this automated mask personalized product on the software side. I'm still blown away that something like this, including the UI, can be created without writing a single line of code. I output a couple of variations here. One is generated off a scan of my wife, and the other is based off me. At first these look similar, but if you focus in on the details, you can see how different the finished parts are. My mask is noticeably wider and deeper than my wife's. The nose area is also lower and longer on my mask. At this point, I did want to take a step back and talk about the business implications of systems like this, and why visual programming has the potential to change the future of automated mass-produced products. While there are some companies exploring custom product offerings, they are relatively rare and tend to focus on two methods to generate their custom geometry for manufacturing. The first is through manual creation of custom 3D geometry for printing. This method can be effective and there are many industry specific CAD packages that help with creating custom products out there on the market. The dental industry uses this technique extensively, where the scan data of a mouth is brought in and then a dedicated technician works with special software to create custom teeth trays, for example. The problem is that it is difficult to scale a business like this up because the finished product requires specialized manual input of a technician to create each part. This keeps the prices for these items high because the level of specialization and time needed to create each product. This is why you see this build strategy used mainly in the medical industry or other high margin fields. 
The other option that some custom personalized product companies use is to automate the build process through traditional software development. This gets around the scaling issue of trying to manually create each product that I just talked about, and is more similar to what I'm trying to do here with the VR mask. Most companies will create their generation software by hiring multiple teams of designers and software developers. This requires a massive level of coordination between these groups and the need for a larger number of employees. This level of coordination will naturally result in longer update cycles and a longer runway to bring new products to the market. All these factors combine to make this type of product need a high level of funding to complete. All in all, traditional software automation for creating custom products just has a much higher risk associated with it. This is why I get so excited about visual programming systems like Grasshopper for custom product creation. Designers that have the parametric CAD software experience we talked about earlier can transition into environments like Grasshopper much more easily and be creating automation solutions very quickly. I mean, honestly, I made this automation system for the VR mask on my own as part of a personal project over the course of a few weeks. That's just mind-bendingly low effort to get into a product development space like this. Anyway, with my spiel on the future of industrial design out of the way, I wanted to get back to the VR headset. Now that I have my custom prototype mask done, I'm going to bring it over into Blender and do some animations to get a feel of what the final might actually look like. You can see the custom mask tucks right into the existing fixed hardware enclosure. Again, because the display and tracking hardware is not changing for each mask, all the enclosure parts will stay the same. The only real custom generated component is going to be the part between the enclosure and the wearer's face. There's a lip right around the edge of the entire enclosure that the custom face gasket part will just slip over to hold it in place. Because the custom gasket part will be captured between the display enclosure and my face, I don't really need to worry that much about it being overly secure. Just as long as it doesn't shift around when I'm wearing it or fall off when the headset isn't in use, it should be fine. Went ahead and printed out a full scale copy of the custom mask from my 3D scan in a clear resin. The final will be in an elastic material, but I wanted to do this test with a more inexpensive resin to make sure things were working out all right. It's pretty crazy to see this thing in real life. It's just so different from anything else that's out there. It's just sort of wild. Describing how it feels to wear is kind of tough. Best I can say, it really doesn't feel like anything's there. The Oculus has very noticeable hard points where parts of the mask are putting more pressure on my face. This is just there. It feels like it's kind of molded to my face, which I guess it kind of is. It's crazy. So these last two episodes really get to the heart of why I'm so excited to be an industrial designer right now. The job of a modern commercial industrial designer is about creating very static and low risk solutions to problems. You make a design, send it to production, and then it's pretty much out of your hands. With this solution, you're making a dynamic thing. You're not just creating a single object, but a deeper adaptive system that's always changing. It's just a radically different concept than anything that's happened before in the industrial design field. I believe the last missing key to creating these systems is the use of visual programming environments like Grasshopper. I think software like Grasshopper is going to let a new generation of industrial designers make automated mass personalized product systems, not just static one-off designs. The landscape has changed so fast that things that were impossible just a few years ago are now within reach. I mean, honestly, there's not even really terminology to talk about most of this stuff. It's pretty amazing. That wraps up things for this round. Next episode, I'm going to finish up the CAD on the rest of the VR headset, including the final edits to the enclosure, adding the headphones, and finishing up the strap system. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.